COVID takes its toll on the healthcare system, on the economy, on the markets, and on us all. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, the special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard on why the pandemic is much more than just an economic threat. This is the biggest vulnerability for our national security from the rest of the world over the next decade. And Roger Ferguson on being the only Fed governor in town when the nation was attacked 20 years ago on 9-11. The context was confronting in real time a set of circumstances that none of us could ever have imagined. There was plenty for investors to digest this week in the news, with China continuing a clampdown on what President Xi terms disorderly capital. It's a wild card what the government's endgame is with their policies. El Salvador adopting Bitcoin as legal tender. They are grasping at straws with Bitcoin but I don't think it's going to spread to other countries. There's been a big sell-off today. I think we always have to remember that crypto is still a retail-dominated uh, ecosystem. And, of course, Congress continuing to grind away at the infrastructure and build back better plans. Let's invest in infrastructure, roads, bridges, airports, and seaports, and let's do it in a manner that we don't run up deficits. But hanging over it all was the specter of COVID as cases continued to rise in various parts of the country and of the world, President Biden announcing a new six-part plan for addressing the pandemic. We're in the tough stretch, and it could last for a while. And the ECB backing off just a bit on its emergency pandemic bond buying, but saying the economy continues to need support given all of the uncertainty. The euro area economy is clearly rebounding. However, the speed of the recovery continues to depend on the course of the pandemic and progress with vaccinations. And the markets, the markets this week may have given just a little bit of a hint of a reaction to that in, in, in continuing threat to co from COVID as equities move down at least a bit, with the S&P 500 having its worst week since June, dropping every day in this holiday shortened week. But Treasury yields, on the other hand, actually rose a bit, although it wasn't clear whether that was about risk appetite or increased supply. To take us through what the markets are trying to tell us, we welcome now Rick Reeder. He's BlackRock CIO for fixed income and head of its global allocation team, and Afsani Beshloss, Rock Creek founder and CEO. So, Afsani, let me start with you. Uh, were the markets reacting to COVID, do you think? What do you think happened this week? You know, it was sort of uh, back to school, and um, COVID obviously has been a problem, but it seemed like it really uh, came to hit people as if it's not going away and um, and it's with us, it's it, uh, impacting not just markets, but uh, we've had Dr. Fauci on, you've had him on, and uh, and now we're moving not just from the Delta variant, but uh, potentially other variants. So the market is starting to be concerned about that. The also um, other big uh, item, which uh, is the other big elephant in the room that started impacting markets more this week was obviously things like inflation, the big growth numbers that got adjusted from, uh, from much higher numbers to much lower numbers, whether we were looking at Fed numbers or Goldman or Morgan Stanley or other numbers. So I think all of those came together mm -hmm. this week and <clears throat> um, hit us all. So, so, Rick, let's pick up exactly where Afsani was, because I was going to ask about Goldman and Morgan Stanley, the various numbers that are coming in. Uh, do you anticipate growth may actually not be as fast as we thought it was going to be because of COVID? And if so, how do you take that into account as an investor? Mm -hmm. So I think there's th two things that are slow in growth today that are, uh, and, I, you know, you, <laughs> it's hard to always, you know, we try and simplify things in, into component parts, which is always hard to do. But I think there are two things. One, you have to clearly COVID, and, and you look at parts of the travel sector and leisure, restaurants, et cetera. There's clearly some caution that's, that's coming to the system that's created some growth slowdown. However, the biggest driver of growth slowdown by far, and, and quite frankly, more than anything I've ever seen, is supply. There's not enough supply of product. This actually demand, if you look at the economy, and you see this in all of the consumer sentiment data, all the corporate sentiment data, the demand for product 
is actually quite extraordinary. In the, and by the way, demand for labor, when you look at all of the data, JOLTS data, uh, the ISM employment survey, et cetera, the, the demand is extraordinary. What's happening, and you see this in all the earnings reports too, so in the home builders this week, you see in the autos, or virtually every auto company talking about the semiconductor supply shortage. It's actually a remarkable thing. It's not demand. Demand is actually as high as I've ever seen it. Now, there's some transition because of COVID into things that are online, et cetera, but it's actually supply. Companies can't fulfill the demand. And so a bunch of what's impacted the, some of the equities of these companies is that they just can't get the goods. They can't get the input. They can't get the labor. And that's been, the, been quite frankly, the most extraordinary thing I've seen in, in my career, 35 years of doing this. I've never seen where the economy modulate demand uh, and what the central banks going to do is modulate demand, but it's actually supply that's uh, that's creating this dynamic today. Okay, so Rick, let me commit heresy uh, in financial journalism. Is it possible we're paying too much attention <laughs> to the Fed given that? Because as you just suggested, the Fed can't do a whole lot about supply. I mean, it's it's actually remarkable because when a neat piece of economic data comes out, like the employment data and the kind of like the number last uh, this this last week came in a bit softer. There were some reasons why it came in softer, including some of the seasonal, some of the education jobs that will take a bit of time to come in. But there's a knee-jerk reaction in markets because this is the way we've operated for decades. Softer data, oh my God, we need central bank policy. The fact of the matter is quantitative easing is not doing anything to create <laughs> to create any, any uh, increase in supply chain. It's not doing anything to actually increase the supply of labor Unemployment benefits rolling off will. The summer ending, will people come back to work, that will. But monetary policy has actually no influence. It modulates demand, but we don't need to modulate demand today. We've got this incredible tailwind, CapEx spending, R&D spending from companies. Consumer, that is, has cash on hand, is, is delevered. Their house is in, is in great shape. It's a big part of the wealth component. Right. So the central bank activity is part of why I think tapering. I think it's it is. I think it's reached the point of absurdity. The Fed should be pulling it back, and it won't impact. It will not impact economic growth whatsoever. In fact, when you think about the supply problem versus demand, right. when you don't have enough supply, right. and the demand is accelerating, you have price pressures. You don't want to exacerbate that 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 what could be a runaway inflation dynamic. What could be accelerated the inflation is part of why the ECB is pulling back. You know, we don't need to we don't need to operate in emergency conditions today. So, Afsani, I don't know if it's supply or demand, but we're certainly getting news out of Beijing. We got more news this week as we have President Xi really clamping down on one part of his industry after another. What is going on and what is it telling investors? Is China investable right now? You know, a lot of investors are looking at China really carefully and wondering whether it's time to maybe go neutral or reduce or take the feet off the pedal at the moment. Um, now, that may or may not make a big difference because foreign investors in China may only account, depending on which Chinese market you're looking at, anything from 5 to 25 percent approximately of the total market. So they will, there will be an impact. And obviously, the Chinese want that uh, foreign investment in their market, both private and public markets. But it's really interesting. I think the thing to me that was the most worrisome was not all the things we've been reading about on uh, clampdowns. Maybe they do need better regulation of their stock markets and across the board, uh, all the markets in China. But when they said they're going to start having government ownership in certain companies, whether it's DD or others, it's sort of, I don't want to take it back to Putin and, Germ and, and Russia, but you know it does remind you a little bit of a very different scenario and uh, that can be very, very worrisome if that trend continues. Uh, at the same time, let's not forget, as uh, Rick was saying and you were saying, David, uh, and a friend of the program has recently written, Dan Jurgen on supply chain problems, the ports, right, whether you're looking at China, whether you're looking in mm -hmm. California, our railways, um, they're all clocked, right? So regardless of what agreements are made between the two countries, those are not going away unless we have a really good infrastructure bill here and start building infrastructure. But that's going to take a few years. So, Rick, to come back to you just for a moment on China, we also had President Biden this week calling up his friend, good friend, President Xi, to talk to him at long last. Uh, does it bother you we don't appear to have a U.S. policy toward China eight months into this administration? So, I mean, I, listen, I, I think people underestimate the, the, the intertwined nature of the U.S. Economy and, and, and China. You think about global trade, the trade, bilateral trade, US China, is well over $600 billion. 
And, and actually, if you think about the size of the two economies today, it dwarfs the rest of the world. U.S. is about a $22 trillion economy. China is about a $17 trillion economy now. You know, you think about it, when you put that in perspective versus other economies, Spain's about a trillion, a little over a trillion. You're talking about two behemoths. It is incredibly important. I think, you know, when people say to me, what keeps you up at night or what do you focus on? Gosh, U.S., China, China particularly, because you know, China's clearly their growth is slowing today, which I don't think is a, is a permanent uh, issue. I think it's a short-term issue, but China's growth is slowing. I think people underestimate for global trade, for commodity demand, for emerging market uh, prosperity and trade, for European growth. China has become really, really important. It is significant, and quite frankly, the markets will react to U.S.-China relations because it has become the bilateral nature of that relationship and the size of those two economies in the world that I are just are overwhelming relative to the rest of the economy. Okay, Rick Reeder, NFSIDE specialist, will be staying with us as we're going to turn our focus specifically to the bond market and the incredible appetite we saw just this week for even more borrowing. We'll have more of our roundtable with Rick Reeder of BlackRock and Afsani Beshlas of Rock Creek. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, we saw a deluge in bond issuance with a record 21 deals on Monday and nearly $80 billion in new issuance over the course of a short week. Our roundtable of Sonny Beschloss of Rock Creek and Rick Reeder of BlackRock have stayed with us. So, Rick, at what point do we get nervous that companies are buying this much money? You know, David, I, mean, I think, quite frankly, if you said to me, what are the top stories of the week? I actually think the amount of digestion of, of, of product was extraordinary. I mean, the amount of investment grade credit supply that's coming to the market, we're going to get a, you know, roughly $150 billion this month. The amount of high yield supply that's coming to the market that just keeps breaking records, the amount of treasury supply that keeps breaking records, by the way, equity supply. It's right. It sort of puts in a perspective. Why, why I always find the irony of, you know, keep talking about is the Fed going to taper 15 to 20 billion a month of treasuries. We're getting 150 billion of investment grade supply. But the market has an incredible receptivity to all this paper. And it's because I think people underestimate the A, the demographic condition that we're in, the liquidity condition we're in. And it's actually not enough assets for pension funds, for insurance companies, for international investors at the right yield today. It's part of why I talk all, uh, uh, quite a bit about the crowding out dynamic of central banks. There is extraordinary amount of demand. The interesting thing this week, you saw the ECB pulled back, as you said earlier, on their buying. What did rates do? Rates moderately rallied on the backside of it. We don't need that additional buying. The system can absorb amazing amounts of, of product. And we're in a unique point in time that, uh, that it's not going to go away tomorrow. So I, anyway, I thought that was the biggest the biggest story of the week is just watching all of this product. And you know, gosh, we were, you know, I think, I think a lot of investors like ourselves have built up cash anticipating the supply that's coming. And, and boy, you saw that paper getting absorbed readily across markets this week. So, Afsani, as you know so well, I get nervous when we say it's different this time. I mean, normally, I think when companies are borrowing that much money, the balance sheet really gets skewed and there's a piper to pay somewhere down the road. Am I wrong? Is the world different in part because of the demographic reasons that Rick just identified? Certainly, the interest rates are low. Uh, but should we be concerned? As you invest in companies, do you take a hard look at the balance sheet? certainly are looking at uh, the credit rating of companies more and more and more as we're going along and looking at uh, you know the higher end more and more uh, for the very reason that you just said David the two things it's obviously you know if you have such cheap money right now and there is an expectation of rates going up no question that companies are going to raise uh, raise bond issues whether they need it immediately whether they don't they're going to do it right now the other thing that is interesting, and we saw also with Verizon and Walmart, was that they're also increasing their issuance of ESG and green bonds. And, um, and those actually had higher yields, which surprised us. But that was also um, an interesting factor, given the amount. And that also got absorbed very, very quickly and easily. So I think I agree very much also with what Rick is saying. Liquidity is enormous in the market. And people are looking for assets across the board, bonds, equities, you know, real assets. Uh, and so that is pushing people 
towards um, towards whatever size bond issues uh, are going out, they're getting absorbed even faster. In terms of concern, I think no question that you have to start looking at the quality of companies compared to you know, in the beginning of this cycle or, or you know, beginning of, uh, of the liquidity jump. And, um, and I think everyone is doing that right now. So I kind of want to come back to inflation. Maybe we've talked about it too much on this program, but I want to come back to that again. Ken Rogoff uh, from Harvard wrote a piece this week who said, we should be a little bit nervous because with all this leverage coming in, it might limit the optionality of the Fed if they do need to react to inflation, because if they start raising rates, it's really going to cause mischief. Are you concerned about that? Does it limit the options available to the Fed? I mean, you know, part of why I, mean, I, think, I think there's a really tricky thing at the Fed, and part of why I think they need to start moving. I think they do de de do need to build in some optionality. Listen, interest rates are going to stay low for a really long time. You know, I think you know you are getting more inflation working its way into the system. I think I don't really think inflation is going to create tremendous stress. I, however, I don't think we should eat, overdo it on, mon on monetary policy. But I think the Fed needs to be thoughtful about to so think about the, you know the tailwinds we talked about that are in the economy today from the, all the monetary policy stimulus, all the fiscal policy stimulus, and we're going to get more. We can debate the size. We're going to get more fiscal policy stimulus, and you think about cash on hand that companies the wherewithal for them to spend. The Fed's in a tricky spot. If you, you know, when we look at the next Fed meeting, you look at their expectations of where interest rates are going to be in 2023, 2024. The expectation is that they're going to be raising rates in 2023, 24. Now is when you have the tailwind. The economy could very well slow two years hence. And then you're, the Fed's going to be in a position where, gosh, now we've got to raise rates uh, when we don't have those series of catalysts driving economic growth. So part of why I think that the Fed needs to build some optionality today is uh, you've got all these tailwinds. You know growth is going to be durable. You know hiring is going to be durable when you see those sort of indicators in surveys. And, and so build some optionality. And I think you're seeing this. We talked about the ECB. We talked about Bank, you know, Bank of Canada, the Bank of England, the Bank of Korea. Pull back a bit on emergency policy because you do need to be thoughtful about future optionality. Uh, so, Afsani, give us some investment advice here. <laughs> where are there options? Where, where is there return to be gotten? And, and given all the liquidity going on, that drives down returns typically. Where, where are there opportunities out there to get return? So, I think uh, on the negative side, we just talked about bonds, I think, and you asked about credit. So, those are probably areas you want to be really careful about on the high yield side. And Rick knows about that a lot more than anybody else. Um, on the positive side, again, I think. Because of what we just heard from Rick, that huge amount of liquidity, there will be a lot of pressures on the equity markets, but equity markets, certain parts of them, uh, particularly better companies with better balance sheets, I think will still be desirable to people. And then moving on, uh, it, uh, Europe probably is a really interesting place because they've been behind us. Uh, and as they are getting out of uh, the same pressures as we just talked about, Europe, European equities will be also very interesting. Last but not least, obviously, um, as I've said before, we still think that the biggest opportunities are in that intersection of technology with the education and health and uh, climate related property tech, all those kinds of things as our lives are getting changed. So Rick, same question to you. You probably put more money actually to work than anybody I know, not to take anything away from Sani, but you have an awful lot of money you put to work. Where are the opportunities that you're looking at? I mean, I agree with virtually everything up Sonny said. And, and uh, from listen, I don't think the equity market is too high. I actually think, I mean, there are a number of companies. There are, you can find some equities that trade at too high a multiple. But boy, I, you know, when you look at companies throwing off the sort of free cash flow that they're throwing off, the uh, the earnings uh, power that they're throwing off today, I mean, we find that a lot of companies are off 20, 25%, 30% return on equity. And their multiples, you know, in that environment, when you're long that much cash, you can do MA, you can do CapEx, you could do RD. Well, I don't think the equity market in aggregate is too high. What I do worry about a little bit is we talked about there's not a lot of in quality fixed income, there's not a lot of value. But what happens is everybody shifts to one side of the boat, which can create, you know, some tricky dynamics, which is something that, that we're keeping an eye on. But listen, I think I think I still think there's opportunities in bespoke financing in parts of the credit market. Uh, by the way, I think the loan markets provided some real value recently without a lot of duration, without a lot of duration risk. You know, some of the securitized assets, commercial real estate, resi real estate, real assets, as Afsani said. So there's some there's some places to put some money to work. You know, what I what I think today though is you know, people need to be thoughtful about, you know, when when interest rates, when real rates of interest are are grossly too low, 
you can create imbalance in portfolios. You can get he too heavy weighted beta in the portfolio, which is unstable. And so, you know, holding higher levels of cash in portfolios makes a lot of sense today. So I think you got to be, you know, thoughtful about where you're going, but thoughtful about how much beta you're taking because it's a right. weird point in time where you can't build a traditional sense of balance in your portfolio using things like treasuries or agency mortgages because the Fed's buying all of those. Afsani, I want to give you the last brief word here. In Washington, what about political risk? Because there are a lot of things going on in Washington that could affect some of these valuations, such as taxation, such as regulation of tech. But don't forget, taxation has, is going to have a potential negative impact. Infrastructure is going to have a positive impact. We really don't know. Net, net it may still be mm -hmm. positive. That's a very well put. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows what's actually going to get done down there? There's a lot of work back and forth left to be done. Okay, thank you so very much to Sonny Beschloss. She's the founder and the CEO of Rock Creek down in Washington. And also Rick Reeder, who is both on the fixed income and the equity side at BlackRock. As I say, investing perhaps more than just about anyone I know, two of the smartest investors that we have around. Thank you very much for a great discussion. Coming up, we take a look at the week ahead on Global Wall Street. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. It's time to look at what lies ahead next week for Global Wall Street. Next week, David, plenty of eco data of note. We have China's monthly activity update as well as trade from India and Japan, plus jobs data from Australia as well as South Korea. On the earnings calendar, the world's biggest glove maker reports on Friday. That's Malaysia's top glove, which was given the green light to resume exports to the United States this month. And on the political front, the race to succeed Yoshihide Suga as Japan's prime minister heats up as campaigning begins for the LDP party's leadership election. Ridica? Thanks, Sophie. UK inflation will probably steal the front page for economic data in the week ahead with expectations of a runaway number for August. That comes out on Wednesday. We'll also get the UK jobless rate out on Tuesday and a second reading of Euro area CPI on Friday. Romain? Thanks, Ridica. Apple's annual iPhone unveil is slated for Tuesday. Investors, they're looking not only for guidance on what demand will look like, but for clarity on whether global supply chain issues will hamper the timeline for production of those new phones. Another big event is Skybridge Capital's SALT Conference. The event, which was canceled last year, will be held in person and is likely to be the biggest investor conference in New York City since the pandemic started. And an interesting investor day for Chevron. The oil giant is focusing the event on climate change and ESG issues. It's an unprecedented investor day for a major oil company, and it comes less than four months after a tiny climate conscious activist fund forced Exxon to surrender a quarter of its board seats. It will be interesting to see what Chevron CEO Mike Worth has to say about the company's lower carbon strategy. David? Thanks to Sophie Ritica and Romain. Coming up, we reflect on what happened 20 years ago when Wall Street and the nation were attacked on 9-11. With Roger Ferguson, who was the Fed vice chair who led the financial system's response to the crisis. Our entire goal for the next three days was to keep the financial system functioning, thereby keeping the entire economy going. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. America heard the news as it was going to work, going to school, or just waking up. An airplane is reportedly has crashed into the World Trade Center. That is a live shot. 17 minutes after the first plane hit the World Trade Center's North Tower, a second plane hit the South Tower. Oh my God. President Bush was in Florida visiting an elementary school. His chief of staff leaned over and whispered, America is under attack. 
A third plane crashed into the Pentagon. A fourth plane appeared to be heading to Washington, but it crashed in Pennsylvania after passengers and crew tried to regain control from the hijackers. By then, the FAA had taken an unprecedented step. Every airline in U.S. airspace was ordered to land at the nearest airport. Three days later, President Bush went to ground zero. What became known as the global war on terrorism was about to begin. I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Wall Street never opened on 9-11. The open was delayed after the first plane struck and then canceled after the second plane crashed. Markets wouldn't open until the following Monday. It was the longest shutdown since the Great Depression. Once trading resumed, there was a massive sell-off, the biggest one-day loss in the history of the New York Stock Exchange. The Dow Jones Industrials were down 14%, but by early October, stocks were back up to where they'd been the day before the attacks. Almost an entire generation has grown up since 9-11. On this 20th anniversary, many will join those who can never forget that day and remember the nearly 3,000 people who were lost. When the planes hit on 9-11, Roger Ferguson was serving as the vice chair of the Federal Reserve, and he was the only reserve governor on duty in Washington. So it fell to him to fashion an immediate response to something none of us had ever seen. We're delighted now to welcome Roger Ferguson back to Wall Street Week. Thanks for being with us, Roger. Take us back 20 years now. I know you've thought about it a fair amount. Uh, what did you face? What did you do? Well, as you said, uh, first, let me thank you for having me on the show. It's always a pleasure to be here. You know, as you said, uh, the context was confronting in real time a set of circumstances that none of us could ever have imagined. Um, and so, you know, my the good news was in some ways my wife called me at about nine o'clock or so uh, to let me know that something was going on. Um, I saw the second plane go into the second tower and knew immediately that uh, there was going to be chaos uh, in and around Wall Street. Obviously, I didn't foresee, you know, the eventuality of the towers falling. But my first step, uh, literally at about 9, 10 or 9, 15, was to call a woman named Louise Roseman. Not a household name, but she was responsible for reserve bank operations and for payment systems. Um, and you know, I worked with her and immediately at 944, we put out a statement, the first of several statements that we made on that day, um, uh, that indicated that um, something called Fedwire was operating and it would stay open uh, as late as necessary for orderly transitions. Now, for the average person, that wouldn't mean very much. For individuals in the financial markets, it meant that the uh, veins, the arteries, the plumbing of the financial payment system was still operating, which was critically important for moving payments around, which was the most important thing. You know, so after that, uh, the next step was to say, gee, um, particularly once we saw the towers fall, um, what's the Fed's reaction going to be? Um, and what we did was convene a discussion. Um, I had a statement all prepared that was very brief. Uh, and that second statement said, and this was for the public, that the Federal Reserve was open and operating, sentence one and sentence two, uh, which was more for the technician, uh, that the discount window would be available. So what did that mean in normal speak? Open and operating is pretty clear. Uh, what it meant in the second part was um, not only was the uh, payment system, the, the veins and the arteries working, but that we, the Federal Reserve, were prepared to pump the lifeblood, the liquidity uh, into that system to keep it functioning. And our entire goal for the next three days was to keep the financial system functioning, thereby keeping the entire economy going. And, and that was a single goal. That was a purpose. And fortunately, uh, things worked out well for us. Uh, how vulnerable were we as a country because of a particular location of the World Trade Center and the damage done down there? Because an awful lot of that plumbing, as you say, the physical plumbing is right in that vicinity. We were very vulnerable. Um, uh, we actually didn't know how vulnerable we were, frankly. Um, but in that region, uh, lower Manhattan, major financial services firms well understood. Um, the New York Stock Exchange, 
everyone understands the value there. Importantly, you know, one of the major uh, banks that does the clearing between other institutions was headquartered there. Uh, so we knew all of that, as well as the, the New York Federal Reserve Bank, which is pivotal to the operations. What we didn't know was uh, that there were a number of telephone connections within a few blocks uh, of the World Trade Center. And so much of the financial infrastructure actually had what we call a single point of failure, those telephone connections. So we were actually um, surprisingly vulnerable uh, to this kind of attack on that day. Uh, but fortunately, you know, backup systems worked uh, and we actually got through uh, with less damage than would have been possible um, had, had things uh, not had the kind of uh, backup that we ultimately found necessary. Roger, you were a key leader in a key place at a time that, as I say, was unprecedented. Nobody could have anticipated. From that experience, what could you tell others who might be thrust into that kind of situation, not to that degree, but similar circumstances, a crisis that comes up you can't experience? Well, there are a number of lessons that we learned uh, that we could share with everyone at this uh, around how to manage through a crisis. One I've already talked about, which is while the spotlight's often on the leader, it's actually the team that matters. Uh, and you have to really rely on the expertise, in the case of the Fed, of literally thousands of people uh, to do their jobs. Um, and so the team matters. Second point is very much around having clarity of goal, of intention, of principle. Um, as I said, um, the Federal Reserve's main goal on that day was to use all of our resources to keep the financial system afloat in the United States and more, by definition, more globally. Um, and so that's important. Be clear about what the guiding principles are. The third lesson on that day was communication, communication, communication. In the midst of a crisis, people are looking for clarity. Without facts and, and, and guiding principles from the top, people make things up. So communication is really important. Uh, and the fourth lesson there is actually the leader does, or the leadership team does play a role across all those things. You know, the leadership team has got to be clear about the guiding principles. The decisions that the leadership team has to make has to be driven by expertise. Two other things that are important around the leadership team. One is obviously fortitude. You know, you don't want to see uh, the leaders quaking like a, a bowl of jelly when you get into a, a crisis. Uh, and then the fourth thing for the leadership team is a surprising one, which is empathy. When you're going through a crisis, it affects everybody differently. And an understanding of that is, I think, really important. Uh, Roger, we can't anticipate the next thing that cannot be anticipated by definition, but let's talk about risks going forward. It's a different world today than it was 20 years ago. It's much more on the internet. It's all much more in the cyber world, rather the physical world of traders at a trading floor down in Southern Manhattan. Uh, what do we know, what do you think about the resilience we, we, we might have if we had a major failure of cyber? Look, I think that's a major challenge for every financial services firm and for all of our institutions. Unfortunately, we've seen sort of elements of that when you have these so-called ransomware uh, attacks or denial of service attacks at a small level. We haven't seen it systematically across an organization or across a financial system, but I would say that's one of the areas to really watch. Uh, and there have been hints of how dangerous that could be. And so that's one that I worry about you know, a great deal. I think all of us do. Um, the good news is it is an area that is uh, one of intense focus. You know, the bad news is that the actors are not just state actors anymore, and they're not necessarily sort of large. They can be small individual actors that are hard to uh, detect. And so I think right now we're in a, you know, sort of a bit of an equilibrium. I think the risk around cyber is much higher. I think our expectations and awareness are much higher, but we haven't really experienced the full magnitude yet. And I, it is an area that I think we should pay a great deal of attention to. Roger, thank you so very much for being with us on Wall Street Week. That's Roger Ferguson. He's the former president and CEO of TIAA. Coming up, we wrap up the week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard, as Wall Street Week continues on Bloomberg.
Wall Street Week. I'm David West, and we're going to conclude the week as we always do with our special contributor here on Wall Street Week. He is Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, thank you so much for being with us. One of the big developments, I think, of the week really had to do about COVID in so many different ways, but one of them was President Biden speaking to the country late in the week, really setting out a fairly extensive program to sort of almost do a reset on our attack on this pandemic. What do you make of what the president is proposing? I think he did the right thing. Uh, I think this is going to be with us in very serious ways for a very long time unless we get the vaccination rate up. And what he did is necessary to get the vaccination rate up. I think it's supported by the vast majority of Americans, and I think it will be accepted uh, ultimately by most other Americans. This is like fluoride in the water. This is like the tests that our kids have to take to go to camp or uh, go uh, to school. This is like going through security at airlines. A more complicated and dangerous world requires things that didn't used to be required. And this is an example uh, of that. And we are struck that he's doing it right now. Uh, two years from now, it'll be hard to imagine a world where there haven't been uh, vaccination uh, requirements uh, good for uh, the administration. I do think that there's a crucial dimension of all of this, which is what's happening globally that is still not getting enough attention. And this has been something I've been focused on for a long time leading up to uh, the G20 with our panel uh, on that. We need much more global vaccination. We need much more uh, preparation for the next uh, pandemic. And this is the biggest vulnerability for our national security from the rest of the world over the next decade. That the virus mutates, that the virus takes a new form, that a different pathogen uh, comes along, and that we are not ready. That is the, by far, a greater risk of Americans losing their lives prematurely from a foreign threat relative to military conflict, relative to terrorism, even for the next few years, or relative uh, to climate change. And we just need a major effort uh, to stop uh, this threat. Remember, Americans right now are dying uh, at a rate of a 9-11 every two days. Maximizing our preparedness for threats of that kind, which also means engaging in the global dimension, has to be a central priority for our country. And I hope we'll be moving on uh, to that. I'm encouraged by the reports of what the president is going to be doing during the UN General Assembly uh, meetings. I'm encouraged by the signs, but real and bold U.S. leadership on uh, that issue in conjunction with other countries is, I think, the single most important foreign policy and national security challenge facing our country. Larry, another a significant set of developments over the week has been what's been going on in China and what we're now calling disorderly capital from Beijing. They call it disorderly capital as they continue to clamp down in various parts of their industry. At the same time, President Biden now has reached out to President Xi. They've had a long conversation, although I do note I don't think we have a China policy yet under the Biden administration. What do you make of China? How big a problem is it for the U.S. economy and for, for U.S. business? Look, I, I think the the glory days of doing business in China and getting rich for most American businesses were never fully there. And to whatever extent they were there, I think that's going to be very attenuated going forward. The predictability and of a Chinese business environment is not anything that anybody's going to be able to rely on for quite a while after the magnitude of the sudden uh, changes. The, this is surely going to have implications in terms of predictability, in terms of reliability of enforcement for any idea that the Chinese currency or some Chinese digital currency is going to be a threat uh, to the dollar. And we need to understand that what's happening in China is not mostly about us. 
It is about the imperatives of uh, cohesion in an extraordinarily complex and very rapidly uh, transforming society. So what we need to do is take the temperature down, demand uh, less, set our most uh, crucial priorities, insist on our uh, core interests, which cannot be every concern uh, that we have, and have a pragmatic uh, relationship with uh, China. It would be a grave mistake if we were to seek across the board confrontation uh, with China. It would be a grave mistake if we were to pre prioritize immediate commercial interests over deeper national security uh, interests. And it would be a grave mistake if we were not prepared to work hard to find elements of uh, common ground. Uh, the truth is that China's potential contribution to either global pandemic or to climate change is as great as any other national security challenge uh, they present. And we need to recognize that as we approach China. Larry, you mentioned the temperature with China. Let's talk about the temperature with inflation back here, something we've talked about pretty much every week here, your concerns about inflation. I see some other people are starting to echo what you said. In fact, we had Ken Rogoff. You pointed out in your tweet, Ken Rogoff wrote on this uh, for Project Syndicate, saying there are some parallels, actually, with the 60s and 70s, including even our withdrawal, disorderly, I think it's fair to say, withdrawal from Afghanistan, what happened in Vietnam, what happened with productivity, various aspects. How concerned should we be right now that we could actually have a repeat of the 60s and 70s? Look, I, I don't think we're anywhere close to the kind of uh, Carter-era double-digit uh, inflation. But I do think we're in very serious danger of repeating almost all the mistakes of the 1960s and early 1970s. And there's a parallel in a growing chorus of voices saying that accepting more inflation because you've gotten more inflation is the lesser of evils and that you should just accept more inflation and promise that eventually you will stop it. That, I think, is setting us up for some very substantial difficulties uh, down the road. And finally, Larry, we're marking, of course, the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks on the United States. And it's a time for reflection about what happened 20 years ago, but also a time to think about what we've learned in the 20 years in between. What do you think we've learned? David, I, I'm going to say something different than a lot of the commentary, which emphasizes the various successes of our response. And I don't disagree with any of that. But I remember asking a very wide range of experts and knowledgeable people uh, in the aftermath of 9-11, what they thought the prospects for terror attacks were over the subsequent period. And I don't think you could have found anyone in the fall of 2001 who would have expected that we would have been as successful in avoiding terrorist attacks in our country and successful in avoiding terrorist attacks in uh, our allies as we have been. And I think all of us uh, who are not uh, directly involved in national uh, defense and national security owe thanks to uh, those who have worn uniforms, those who have uh, protected us, those who have mounted uh, the necessary uh, investigations. And that's a perspective that we need to have, even as we do recognize the uh, many mistakes uh, that we have made. Okay, Larry, thank you so very much. That's our special Wall Street Week contributor. He's Larry Summers of Harvard. Coming up, one more thought about what was unique about 9-11 and what was not. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. 
when everything around us, including the way we work and live, has been interrupted, uninterrupted service is peace of mind. Kimmy from Customer Support is responding to a 500% increase in daily call volume, no matter what. We keep on, so you can keep on. Finally, one more thought. Once in a lifetime, or maybe not. 20 years ago, our world was rocked by those terrorists attacking the United States. We had an unprecedented attack on innocent civilians on U.S. soil. We saw symbols of American power, both commercial power and military power, destroyed or burning. And most of all, we lost members of our family and we lost our friends, including three colleagues right here at Bloomberg. The very foundation of our financial system was shaken to its core. We had to close the stock market for a full week. Stock prices plummeted. And we thought, whatever else, we would never see anything like it again. Well, we were partly right, but partly wrong. We have had at least two instances of that shaking to our core of the system that we thought would never happen. First, with the global financial crisis back in 2008, when financial engineering, let's be frank, got ahead of us doing more than we understood it was doing and far more than we could regulate. Going back decades, our, the government had really failed the American people because the financial system had not kept pace with the modern financial markets. And second, just last year with the pandemic, a once in a century event that brought the entire world economy to a stop, requiring us to bring it back up again. It is both a demand shock and a supply shock. It affects trade, and services. It is internal and external. The good news is that it turns out we were more resilient than we knew at the time. But there are two ways in which what we have today is quite different from 20 years ago. First of all, this time the risk may not be physical, it may be cyber. And a lot of people think that the cyber risk is even greater than what we faced before. Cyber risk is probably the biggest risk I think the financial system faces uh, in the world. It's a global risk. This is the uh, single most existential threat uh, to the financial system. We are in effectively a war on cybersecurity. And second, 20 years ago, the way we responded to a common enemy was to come together in unity. This time, we have a common enemy in a virus that is actually more deadly and more destructive than what we faced on 9-11, and yet our response has been the opposite. We have used things that could be defenses of the homeland, things like masks, things like vaccines, to divide us, to become political symbols that we can disagree about. We have a long way to go before we overcome this latest enemy of COVID-19. The question is whether we can overcome it without showing the kind of unity this time that we showed 20 years ago. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston, this is Bloomberg. See you next week.